ridiculous. But it's chilly for us here in middle in the middle of summer here in South Africa. And there's still the odd cloud on the horizon. I was going to go to Cheetah Plains, but now I'm a little bit nervous that it's going to rain upon us once again. Zebra, you're playing very hard to get this morning. Now this morning I actually had a quite an exciting start, or an almost exciting start. I uh, stopped on Quarantine Clearings, which is the big open area outside our camp. And there was an Impala U all on her own, looking discomforted to say the least. And of course all of our ewes are heavily, heavily pregnant at the moment. Uh, I thought perhaps maybe there was a chance we were going to have a live birth. There is still a chance we're going to get a live birth on one of these safaris any morning now. But she wasn't giving birth. She was just a little bit constipated. I thought she was all on her own. Perhaps she was going to go and join. But she did just go and join the rest of the herd once she was a little bit relieved. So there we go. I, I had a false alarm this morning. We did sit with her for a good few minutes, waiting to see what would play out. But she's absolutely fine and definitely not giving birth. And of course, we've had all manner of live births on these safaris from the James's zebra birth, which I've never seen, and I must say, looked like the most amazing sighting. I've never seen a zebra giving birth. Um, to wildebeest, to impala. And now is the time for live impala births. So every single impala herd that we see this morning, because this, of course, is the perfect time of day, every single impala herd that we see we're going to be stopping at and watching just to see whether there are any signs of new babies and whether there are any signs of females moving off on their own and then we're also going to be looking for lions leopards elephants and anything else in between so all in all i think it's going to be a lovely morning the air smells crisp and clean the birds are chirping away and it is going to be a beautiful morning i think we might even have a little bit of sun Look at that. Clouds are breaking apart and it looks as though the great deluge of 2016, the end of 2016, has ended. All those three mills that we had, I think that that epitomizes the great deluge of 2016, unfortunately. But it's not just myself out there. Without any further ado, let's go over to Brent so that he can say good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Brent. I have jean on camera and we're on the hunt for the lions. I heard them roaring just as we got up this morning. Uh, it sounded like they might be somewhere in this area, but they only roared once and so far silence and no tracks just yet. So we're going to slowly make our way back towards where they were last night and hopefully uh, we have some lion luck. Now remember this is 100% live, you're able to ask us questions, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. And yes, uh, the great deluge of 2016 was more of a puddle. You got him there, Jandre? Bird. Um, where's this to? There. Oh, lions are roaring, but let's have a look at that. Behind us. Ah, well, anyway, let's just let me see if I can find this grey headed bush rack. There he is. Top right corner. Up right, 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 other right. There you go, that orange thing in the middle there. Oh no, it's an orange breasted. No, it is a grey headed bush rock. There he is, beautiful bird. Oh, off he pops. Also nicknamed the Sporkfall. Where do those lions sound like? Caligo shortcut. Mysterious flying lions to get there. Sounded like over there, so that's where we're going to go. Now, as I said, that call I heard, or on the pre-show, that call I heard wasn't a proper roar. It sounded more like a contact call. So there might be still some lions moving through to where those ones are roaring. So let's head there. But nice way to start with a grey-headed bushrike. Now, of course, yesterday was big birding day. We managed to get over 60 species between 
the different feeds uh, over the day and uh, a really great morning with 36 species coming off rusty alone and uh, I will keep looking for the small obscure birds for those of you with bird lists to try keep that bird list ticking. There's a couple of migrants that we haven't seen yet on camera. Uh, the European roller, the European golden oriole and uh, what else? Oh, there's a pygmy kingfisher. So there's a couple still to look out of first and of course we're always checking for the first baby wildebeest or the first uh, baby warthogs of the season as well. I'm just going to see if Rexon is out, so if I can drive past his lodge. Rexon, Rexon or Taxon come in. Morning Rexy, did you get that in Gala Audio? No, there's other audio, Galaga shortcut for tele access. I'm on in Vuvu heading that way. Uh, can I go past your Marty? Thanks very much, yeah. So there was some audio, I don't know, it sounded between Twin Dams and Vuertela Dam, and there's other audio to the west of your car. Kobe, thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna do Gallagher shortcuts and maybe then Impala Road to come give you a hand. Okay, so there's audio all over the place. So we've heard the one there, some over here. Um, Rexon's got other audio that sounds like it's down towards Weaver's Nest. Actually, let's see where Jamie is. She might be quite close to there. Jamie, Jamie. And did you get that update? Firm Rex has got audio, it sounds like Weaver's Nest, Gary May in that area as well. So Jamie was heading down to the south and uh, then to the east, so she is very close to that area. So it could be one of the Birmingham's calling there. This sounded like more than one lion calling close to us here, so this could be the pride. Still no sign of any tracks yet, but tracks uh, after the rain can be quite difficult to spot uh, due to the earth being compacted and hardened. And it becomes very difficult to see tracks, but uh, fortunately uh, the lions have been quite vocal this morning, which makes uh, tracks a little bit less necessary. Yeah, while we speed off to where we think we heard those lions, let's go see if Jamie's got other lions down in the south. Uh, as you heard from Brent, there seems to be several different groups of lions, including some not too far away from me. But as you also heard from Brent, as you said, tracking on a morning like this morning can be quite tricky. And it's easy to find the lions because they're calling, or hopefully they keep calling. I shouldn't actually say that. Never say something's going to be easy out here because it never is if you do that. But I just want to not race off to the lions is essentially where I'm going, just in case the Queen of Juma has actually crossed somewhere along here. somewhere along here and if I go speeding along I am not there's no way I'm going to see her tracks and actually if she's walked on this patch of road there's no way I'm going to see her tracks anyway just because the ground is so solid at the moment but we're going to check all of her regular crossing points just to see whether or not she's come through on the softer sand along here and once we've checked it, then we'll start heading east, we'll start heading in the direction of those lines, and also, of course, towards, well, maybe towards Cheetah Plains. I'm still waiting to see what the weather's going to do to us. I don't fancy another journey racing back with the rain pelting us. What's crossed here? Something's with paws has crossed here. 
but I suspect not leopard paws. No, not leopard paws at all. Hyena paws. You can sort of see what I mean. I don't know, Chad, can you get that one over there? You should just be able to. There we go. See what I mean? The tracks, even in the softest, thickest sand, are basically just splodges in the ground. And if you move any further along away from that thick sand, there you go, that's our hyena track over there. Whoops, sorry, I'm trying to show you. There's the claws, so it's, these are the toes, that's the back of the foot, and the track's going that way. So across the road and into Little Gowrie. Now this is, for our new viewers, this is our southern boundary, so the southernmost place where we can go on Juma, anywhere straight ahead of me, is off limits. We are not allowed there. Other vehicles are, but they're not allowed on Juma and vice versa. So it just depends upon, different lodges can go to different places. The animals, however, have no fences and have no boundaries, except for their own territorial boundaries, of course. And one of the things that this boundary does is it sort of splits at the moment. It splits the Queen of Juma's territory in two. She spends a lot of time there and a lot of time here. And hopefully she's come... What I'm looking for is neat little leopard tracks going that way. No. No. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Something in the air at the moment. It's worse than springtime, summertime. Must be with all the rain, all of the flowers coming out. The trees are looking particularly beautiful. Everything's looking green. And Jamie's sneezing a lot. And it's not just me. There's quite a few of us who are a little bit allergy stricken this morning, or the last few weeks. That seems fine though. There's been no sneezing coming from the back of the vehicle. Not, not yet. Uh, heading towards the dark grey clouds. Good morning to Michael, speaking of our vocal lions this morning, and I'm sorry Michael, I'm going to be not ignoring you, I'm just checking over my shoulder to check for tracks. Uh, you wanted to know, Michael wants to know, why is it we never see the lionesses roaring? Uh, we see the Birmingham Sorry, bird, a bird that we don't often get to see is calling, and I know Brent was trying to get it on camera yesterday. It's called, oh wait, hold on, we might get the display. Ah, oh. sorry Michael, distracted by the bird life of the area. Where are you, little bird? Sorry, this is a bird we never really get to see. I know Brent tried to get it. Ah, I've gone past it. Oh, they're sneaky things. Sorry, now the game drive Rex is trying to call me. Right, sorry, where was I? Michael, speaking of the lions, the... The lionesses do roar, um, and we have seen them roar in the past. Often it is, when they're with the males, it's often triggered by the males calling themselves. So it's often as a result... Sorry. Okay, I'm just going to turn this down slightly. So it's often as a result of being triggered by the male lions. They don't call as often, necessarily. Oh, cuckoo, you horrible creature. <laughs> I was trying to show you a cuckoo. It flew off. Live safaris with birds. Um, yes, but they, the lionesses do roar. We have had them roaring. The best part of when the lionesses roar is when the cubs start to roar as well. We had this amazing experience, Dave and myself. The first, the very first evening that we were testing the infrared, we were sitting with the Nkuhuma Pride all around us, and we couldn't see them with our eyes. We couldn't see a thing. We knew that we could hear them. I mean, now and again, you just hear the soft as the lioness would walk past the vehicle. And it was quite a 
it was a very humbling experience. It just gave me the chills a little bit, to be honest. And just because usually I'm able to use my spotlight. I've sat in the dark with lions before, but you can usually just flick your light on and check where they are. But we sat with just the infrared and the males started calling, the females started calling, and there was this massive cacophony around us. And then all of a sudden, the cubs started going as well. And they were going, which is the cutest baby roar in the world. And that was, uh, in terms of impressions, I have to say that was pretty accurate. That was exactly what they sounded like. <laughs> it was adorable. Ah, do you want to know something funny, Gert? <laughs> Where we drove this morning, the lions just walked right on top of our tracks. There is a lion exactly where we were about 10 minutes ago. Oh well, the joys of live safaris. He must be moving very quickly. He must have just walked out and over our tracks. Right, in that case, I shall head across in that direction for now. I'm going to see if we can't catch up with him. And I won't go too quickly though, just in case I miss something vital here. dear lions and it just goes to show that he is live uh, yes I hear you it's hyena footprints in the sand yep I see him coming out here hyenas why are you never coming back in so sad we hardly ever get to see our spotties anymore our spotted hyenas and you see their tracks every morning but it's as though they've abandoned us Okay, well, we're just going to stop here for one moment so we can look at the large bird sitting in the top of the tree. We'll see exactly. Oh. Where is that roaring? Oh. Oh. Okay, nope, sorry, we got to go. Uh, Rex and oh, I was so confused. There were just roars in my ear, and I was going, why is Rebecca playing me a lion roar? Why now? It's not Rebecca, it's Rexon. He's holding his game drive mic next to the roaring lion. Sorry, that's why we're racing off. I didn't even get a chance to see what bird that was. Um, that was such a disconcerting experience. <laughs> I'm on my way, Rex. Uh, just north of Philemon's Dip. Okay. Right, as I race through, let's go across to Brent, who has found one of those mystical creatures of which I just spoke. We just had a brief visual of a hyena running across the road. Let's see if we can catch a glimpse. There it is. Now I'm wondering whether it's running from that dead hippo. There it is. Now, there's lion audio all over the place this morning, and just looking at that hyena's behavior, it's looking back to where that dead hippo is. I wonder if we might have lost that hippo to lions. All got beaten up by another hyena. Marching, 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 as only a hyena can. You can see that loping stride eats up the meters quite quickly. I can't hear any growling or cackling. But there's definitely something making that hyena a bit nervous, looking back behind it. Let's go have a look what's happening at that dead hippo we found yesterday. So there's one hyena. That's two days in a row I've seen a hyena, which is... Uh, it's been a while since that's happened. Check carefully, carefully through here. 
Now, I was hoping the hyenas might come down to this carcass, but who knows, it could be the Inkahumas have moved on to that hippo, uh, there could be a Birmingham, there could be lions we've never seen before. And that's the wonderful thing about being live in the African bush, we don't actually know what we're going to see every time we jump in the vehicle. Good morning and trip. Trip would like to know, are there brown hyenas in the reserve? Uh, there's a possibility of brown hyenas, Trip. I'm quite sure in Kruger and maybe in southern Manuleti, uh, there has been a brown hyena seen once on Juma about nine years ago. So there is a possibility. Now, with all the man-made water holes, it, it, it'll keep the spotted population of hyenas high, uh, which means the browns generally suffer quite extensively. And uh, for example, the Kruger have started shutting down all its man-made water holes. Uh, they were all put in the 60s and 70s and obviously we've got a better uh, understanding of uh, the ecosystems now. And what happened, and by putting in all those man-made water holes, uh, the Kruger effectively wiped out its own population of brown hyenas by enabling the spotted hyenas that are water dependent to be uh, completely based in an area that they might have seasonally used beforehand. And that area would be utilized by brown hyena. So it is, it is quite interesting and hopefully their populations do come back. But in the Sabi Sands where there's a lot of man-made water holes, uh, there's always a chance that a lost brown hyena might wander through, but uh, to see them regularly would be very unusual. Not far from here though, uh, where my parents live, we've got both spotted and brown hyena, and I've actually found about three different brown hyena dens there. That's only about 60 kilometers as the crow flies. Ah, look, lots of hyenas. Morning, Anthony. Anthony would like to know if I've ever seen an albino, albino hyena. Never. So how many we got there? One, two, three, four, five, six at least. Oh, listen. You can hear the male lion roaring that Jamie's racing to. I think there could even be more than six. Yeah, let's start again. Let's go from the left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think there's another one out of shot. So there we go. One, two, three, four, five. Six, and I think there's one more, seven. Plus the one we saw disappearing, eight. Awesome, so nice to see hyenas. I'm pretty sure this is the Juma clan. They have been denning in the Manuleti. The Manuleti boundary is only 100 or 200 meters from where we are at the moment, or from where they are. And they're a good 100 meters from us. Oh, let's go to the left, please. And there we go. Look, there's a cape vulture. Not a white-backed vulture. And see that much, much paler. It's actually bigger than the, the, the white-backed vultures. The hyenas are harassing the cape vulture. And there was a hyena carrying something, a piece of hippo by the looks of things. It lost its piece of hippo already or swallowed it. There we go, you see the white back vultures? Much darker in coloration. Now this is almost an ideal situation for the hyenas. Lots of nice meat and there's some mud to cool down in, in Sydney's waterhole right next door. <laughs> Out of here, vulture. Oh, 
Uh, unfortunately, it is quite far away. It's inside Buffalo's Hook, but at least there's a nice open patch that we can get a decent view. When was the last time you saw this many hyenas, Jandre? Mm. Months. Yeah, maybe August. August, there we go. Get out of here, Vulture. Ooh, big tummies. Now, the interesting thing about this carcass being so close to the Manuleti is whether it'll pull some unknown lions from the north. We have seen the Salati male lions around here, but I think over the course of the next few days, they're going to build into a mass of vultures in this area. That carcass is right out in the open. And if the hyenas start squabbling, who knows, maybe it might bring in the Birmingham boys as well. And speaking of male lions, uh, it seems like Jamie has arrived with the Birmingham boy who we've heard roaring. And just look at this, we have finally managed to get here and it is Mfumo and Amber Eyes and I'm just going to be quiet for a moment because Amber Eyes is contact calling and I'm hoping she's going to do it again for us. Come on girl. And it was a good chance, or there is a good chance, that Michael, we're going to get the answer to your question in sort of the flesh, so to speak, because you wanted to know why it is we never see the females roar. The two of them were roaring their heads off <clears throat> while I was on my way here, making such a noise. And I'm just waiting to see whether or not they start doing it again. Obviously, yesterday, and there was good evidence that Amber Eyes was coming into Estrus with the male blocking her constantly. Was it yesterday or the day before? I can't remember now. But it seems as though... There we go. There we go. Male and female calling together. And it gives you a nice idea of the difference between a male and a female roar. And there's actually very little of a difference. So her call's slightly shorter and perhaps not quite as bassy. But otherwise, the two of them are actually relatively hard to distinguish, especially at a distance. The male lions will just travel that little bit further because they're bigger and therefore it is deeper. And those amazing sounds are made by what's known as the suspensorium in the animal's voice box or their larynx. That essentially, in most of us, like human beings, it's relatively calcified. If you put your hand on your neck, your voice box, your larynx is, you can feel a relatively solid hyoid bone of your trachea and your voice box is solid. In lions, those voice boxes are relatively loose and floppy which allows them to massively massively expand and create those incredible sounds isn't that just goosebump stuff there is nothing nothing like the sounds of lions roaring first thing in the morning the sun just starting to peek out you can see they're starting to go that golden color and we're treated to the best 
best dawn chorus in the world. And for those of you that had to wake up to sounds of the city this morning, sounds of sirens and traffic, I hope this is a sound that transports you right to the middle of Africa. There is nothing like it. And we're so lucky to have, it was, I actually would like to dedicate that female's roar to Michael, because that was such an appropriately timed question. Well done, Michael. Heads up, she's seen something. What's there, boy? He's seen or he's heard something. Could be Impala moving off in the bushes. Such a beautiful morning. Now, I have made Gert's life a little bit difficult because I'm directly facing one of the other safari vehicles. So he won't be able to come back onto my face just because we can't actually show the faces of the guests in any great detail. Well, you can imagine, you wouldn't want to be on a safari if all of a sudden the camera was on you. Morning, guys. Thanks, Rex. Uh, I want to check you. Okay, you're gonna go see what's up, what they're looking at. Cheers, guys. Such an awesome, awesome sound. Love that sound. And I'm hoping it's not going to be the last of it. It's a nice, cool, nice, cool morning. So there's a good chance that they're going to start to call again. They might even start mating at some point in the not a too distant, not too distant future. Let me duck out of your way. So the amber-eyed female, probably the most distinctive of the Nkuhuma pride, for those of you that are perhaps new to these live safaris, she's part of a pride known as the Nkuhuma pride, a very special pride of lions that we get to see. And she is accompanied by one of four dominant males in this area known as Mfumo, the authority. And he certainly was very authoritative when he started calling. Oh, Dale, a very good morning to you, and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Dale, you want to know about the names of the Birmingham boys, because you've only been watching for eight days. Well, it's lovely to have you on board, Dale, and I look forward to answering many of your questions and your comments in the future. Now, you want to know about the names of the Birmingham boys and what they are. Um, Dale, we've, at, at Wild Earth and at Safari Live, uh, in order to connect people to these incredible animals, we have actually given them a certain names. Um, the first of which is Nsugu. He is the oldest, and his name means gold. Now, Nsugu we hardly ever get to see. He's the oldest of the Birmingham boys, and he's also known as Birmingham Number 1 or Blondie, uh, depending on where you're reading the things. Um, Nena is the second... Hold on, she's gonna yawn. Oh, don't. Sorry, Dale, I'll be with you in a second. Our stations, these and Gala, are now mobile straight west into the block. I don't know if anybody can hear me. Okay, let's stay with them. Sorry, Dale. Nena, the second of the Birmingham boys, his name means warrior. Are they going west? West into the block, sort of towards that Shkova between uh, Philemon's and um, that's Rebecca's Road. The third Birmingham boy is known as Tinho because he has a massively split lip. 
scan that shows his canine tooth, his top lip is split. It has healed up nicely, but at one stage we could see straight through his lip even when his mouth was closed, and we could see his tooth, and we don't know where he got that injury from, but as with all male lions, they come with injuries. And then this gentleman here, whose name is Mfumo, which means the authority. Because he is one of the largest of the Birmingham boys, I think he's the largest, he's definitely a very dominant member of this coalition. So he has been nicknamed the Mfumo. There's something running, oh, it's Impala. Um, hold on a second, we're gonna get a good view. They're gonna keep walking. I'm gonna try and stick with them. And I do have to just pull over to let Tax come through ahead of me, just because he hasn't had a chance to see them and it's going to go into a very thick area. He's showing signs of dominance, stopping to rub his cheek upon a guari bush and then scent mark using his urine spray before he follows on behind the amber-eyed female, not letting her get out of his sight at all. Now, male courting a female that's coming into estrus is a very, very protective force. He basically doesn't let her go anywhere without his express supervision and permission, uh, sometimes even denying her food when they are next to a carcass, and he gets very aggressive even when it comes... Sorry, there's other lions roaring now. She's trying to get to the rest of the pride, and he's just going to keep blocking her. They can even be aggressive towards their own cubs at times. If the cubs are going near their females. Sorry, hold on everybody. I need to do some chattering on the game drive channel to the other guides so that we can communicate what's happening here and coordinate our search and sort of suspicions as to what these lions are going to do next. So while we do that, let's go back over to Brent. So we left those hyenas. We could hear other lions roaring to the east of us. And it sounds like Mfumo and Amber Eyes are changing their direction. Or Amber Eyes is at least. So I think we're going to try to find the rest of the pride. Let's see if we can find any tracks. Now hopefully with that hippo being so close here, the hyenas decide to move back to some of their normal dens which are around here. So I think give them a day or two and we should start checking those dens again, fingers crossed. Okay. Now the great deluge of 2016 was indeed a deluge, but just not here. Uh, a lot of that rain fell to the north of us. Uh, if you look at the satellite maps, they're still raining quite heavily, I would say, on the Mozambique, South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe border around the Limpopo River Valley, and further north into Zimbabwe and Mozambique. And as you can see, the clouds are now starting to break up as the sun gets higher in the sky. So I think by the end of the day, we're going to have some nice, lovely sunshine. But I'm just going to stop here because it's quite pretty in this early morning light as you, we look down our northern boundary to some sort of a misty, misty, ominous, not really ominous looking. It's actually looking quite pleasant. I'm actually going to take a photograph of that. It looks so nice. Here we go, isn't that pretty? That is absolutely gorgeous.
morning, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan's wondering, what do water-dependent animals lack in comparison to non-water-dependent animals? Uh, well, I wouldn't say they lack anything. They just have different uh, techniques. Uh, from the antelope species, uh, the only non-water-dependent antelope we get here is the Stenbock. And uh, that's because they're quite small. They're able to get most of their moisture from dew uh, on the leaves or they dig up tubers. Now, Impala and, and, and Kudu and things like that don't dig up tubers. They, they will walk towards water sources. Now, when it comes to the predators, a lot of the predators are not water dependent, but in an area like this where we have a lot of water, uh, they will take advantage of that. So I'm just trying to see if it carried on flying. It was a cuckoo. Uh, where did you land? It looked like either a levalence or, or, or Jacobin cuckoo. But there he is. Oh no, it's not. Oh, well, that's not what we saw originally, but there's a hornbill there. Uh, the cuckoos obviously kept flying through. And there's a yellow-billed hornbill hopping around in that marula tree, probably looking for the same things the cuckoos are, which is uh, caterpillars. Hoppity hop, hop, hop. Now, what are you running from, bird? There's a. I couldn't see what it was, but a bird came hurtling out of the bush. Could be from another bird. Uh, look quite a big ground bird, so let's go have a look. Oh, this is just getting prettier and prettier as the sun breaks up the clouds. Ah, the bird's got a fright from a, a diker, which is also running at high speed. So, false alarm. Now, just over the next ridge is where I'm thinking the lions were calling, the ones I heard. Lots of bird calls in this beautiful early morning. Sun's getting quite bright already. <laughs> Morningless. Uh, Liz is wondering if we've ever focused a birding expedition only on LBJs. For those of you who don't know what LBJs are, they're called little brown jobs. So, sister killers, larks, pipits, uh, flycatchers, and the like. Uh, many, many times, Liz, uh, I do like a good LBJ. Uh, jean Ray is shaking his head in fear in, in case we decide uh, to LBJ this morning. Well, Liz, you've given me an idea. So, for those of you, let's have a vote. Uh, should we focus on the LBJs? LBJs this morning, the little brown jobs, the hard to identify birds. Uh, let's have a, a vote. See how many people want to focus on the little brown jobs. And we're going to put a poll up on Twitter. So let's see if you want to look at LBJs or we'll just keep doing a normal drive. So let us know on the hashtags Fari Live. There is going to be a poll up on Twitter where you can vote. Well, till we know, I'm going to keep looking for lions. No, hi, Joanne. Joanne is asking about one of the most beautiful birds we get in South Africa, and it is even so aptly named. It is called a gorgeous bushrike. And Joanne is wondering, do we get it here, or is it just rare? Uh, theoretically, it's possible that we get gorgeous bushrike, a gorgeous bushrike here, but this isn't really ideal habitat for them. They prefer slightly wetter areas with uh, permanent water, riverine forests. So uh, there's always a possibility one might meander in, especially if we get lots of rain. But normally I would say it's better to have a look down south. So while we continue on our endeavors towards the east, uh, let's go back to Jamie and those lions. Well, Brent continues on his way to the east. Our lions are going in exactly the opposite direction to the west. And the, they've just stumbled upon a herd of impala that are frantically alarm calling at them. Hold on a moment, let's get closer. 
they were nice and out in the open, but the Amber Eyes is very much on a mission this morning. And he's just following along until she decides to mate with him. Our Amber Eyes was actually watching the Impala intently. She really wanted breakfast, but unfortunately with the male in tow, he's making her life very, very difficult. Constantly watching her, constantly blocking her movement. When she tries to move quickly, he bolts after her aggressively. So there's nothing she can do about obtaining breakfast for the both of them. She's just going to have to, you know, wait until this is all over and until perhaps the rest of the pride catches the, another meal for them. It's not impossible for mating cats to get food, uh, to hunt, but often they are so distracted that they don't necessarily bother. I'm just going to, I'm trying to think how we're going to cross this drainage line. It's going to be a tricky one. I'm going to stay with the lions so that Taxon can cross. Look at the, look at the impala. Running after, just like they did with the lions. I mean with the leopards the other day. Running after them to make sure they can still see them. Because they don't want the lions to, oh! I think Amber Eyes ran at them. Maybe even the male protectively ran at them. <laughs> yep, it was Amber Eyes. She wants, she just wants breakfast. Now the Impala work on the um, very valid assumption that they are faster than a lion. As long as they have enough distance between them and the lion itself, they will be okay. So rather watch and see where the lion is so that you can make sure that she's not hunting you, which all makes complete sense if you're an Impala. It's not the lion you see that gets you, that sort of logic. Although Amber Eyes, I think, just had a jolly good try. Sorry, girl. They all know you're there. And your male friend is... Look at that. Not often you see lionesses spraying back into bushes, into quarry bushes. They do do it. But it just goes to show what sort of um, a hormonally heavy moment this is between the male and the female. The fact that she is scent marking, which we don't often see the lionesses do. But she's scent marking just like a male lifting her tail up and spraying backwards into the trees. There they go. And Julia, you've heard that there are reports that Amber Eyes is six years old and has never have had cubs. And is this true? I believe it is. I believe that to be the case. Obviously, because I have only been working here for a year, I have to go off the reports of others. Um, but that is what I have heard. That's that's the information we've, we've been given. So yes, it is. it seems to be true from what I've heard. Ooh, grasshopper just landed on me. I'll try and find it for you in a moment. Oh no! The end of the road! As to why that is, well there's a chance that she is infertile. There's a chance that she just hasn't been very fortunate with her cub upraising or upbringing. Oh dear. How brave are you feeling this morning, Gert? Very. 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 That's a good answer. You and I have a mission. We gotta get down here. Hold on, everybody. I think we can do it this way. It's amazing what these little cars can get us through. I'm gonna try, ooh, this could be a, a potential sticking point, just this little, this little gully. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take it easy. Tax is with them now, so we, ooh, I wonder what lives in there. Sorry, distraction, something lives in there. Art fog, maybe. Okay, hold on. I think this is the only way we're gonna get through. Hold on. Whee! And we're up. And we're out. And quarry bush. Down you go. So for our... Ouch. 
was fighting back. For our new viewers, just so you know, we're very, very careful, which is why you'll see us weave or bob and weave around. We're very careful about the trees that we go, oh, we drive over. We only drive over certain species and we drive over the young ones that will pop back up. So that quarry bush that I just went over, I checked behind me, it's sprung right back up and it's absolutely fine. Right, where have you two gone? So back to amber eyes. I don't know, it's, it's peculiar, isn't it? Oh, hold on. It is odd if it is true that she has never had cubs, but she might also, bear in mind, the mortality rate can be so high. She might just have had cubs at the most unfortunate times. During takeovers, for example, um, she might just have never been successful in raising them. I don't know what the reason is. It's not just us out and about, but of course Byron is now up and he is out on foot. Let's go and see what he's up to. Good morning. Guys, I'm very sorry. Hold on one second. I need to talk to Rixon. Rix, I'm sorry. Please go again with that message. Sorry. Just bear with me. Copy that. Thank you very much, Rix. I'm on my way. Sorry, everybody. Um, Brent, if you're closer, I'm happy for you to go. Otherwise, yes, I will. Uh, we're just about to hit Philemon's cut line now. Uh, we've crossed that drainage. Okay, copy, Brent. You, you go, you go. Sorry everybody, we obviously Byron didn't have any signal and unfortunately you crossed to me just as I really had a conversation that I had to have because Rexon has found another big cat for us. Hence the, de hence the debate between the two of us, between Brent and myself, as to who should go there and who is closer. So we're about equidistant, but because I'm with the lions, we're gonna send Brent across towards where Rexon is. Oh, and sorry, Rebecca, I turned you right down so I could hear. Sorry. Amber Eyes, where are we going? Okay, I'm just going to let Brent handle that. Figure out directions. Where are you going, my girl? She's missioning. Now she's leading us back towards the drainage system. Hmm, I know, Chat, I know. <laughs> Watch out. Now, Eileen, you wanted to know if it's possible that the Birmingham boys have split into two separate coalitions um, because we haven't seen them together in a long, long time. And the answer is no, that's actually relatively common for a male coalition, particularly a relatively big coalition. So the Timbers were often together, almost always. Um, they might separate for a few days, but they always came back and rejoined. But with the Timbers and with other large male line coalitions, they often do that once they've established themselves. And when they've got a big territory, it just makes sense for them to split themselves up. Now, I'm not quite sure exactly how they go about doing it. Nobody is. You know, is it is it tight bonds between males? Perhaps it seems likely that it's age-related, brothers that might split up. Or is it just coincidental? Is it just a, just a random turn of affairs? But it is... Morning, Lions. Sorry about this. Um... It is very common for this to happen, for this to occur within 
male coalitions. So no, I don't think they've split up at all. They will probably stay separate for most of the time. The only time the four of them might come back, they will might join up again. Every now they might join up, come back together. The last time all four of them. How's your view there, Khat? A little bit forward. There we go. The last time we saw all four of them, at sort of separate times, they weren't all together, but they were in the same place, was when James was in the Mara, one of those first nights that he was in the Mara. Um, the, the times that they will come together um, to show their full four strong strength will be if another coalition starts to move into the area. So if there is a threat to their boundaries, then they will reunite once again. And you know, who knows what these lions get up to in the middle of the night? And that might sound like a weird thing to say, but a male lion can walk easily 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers in a night without even thinking about it. So they could be, and judging by the tracks, they do patrol regularly. They could be walking all the way to Cheetah Plains, having a little bit of a head rub, a nuzzle, a reunion, and then go off their separate ways again. So I don't think that they have split they might, there might be an additional level of conflict between the two and the two, um, especially over a female with East, in estrus. But for now, they've each got a pride apiece, and they don't need to worry too much about mating rights just with each other. Right. So while we settle down with these lions and wait to see what they get up to, let's try again with Byron so he can try and say good morning to you. Good morning everyone, let's try that again. My name is Byron and on camera with me this morning is Viam and then we have Herbert also joining us in the bushwalk. Now we tried to show you, I'm not sure if you managed to see the hippo that was blocking our way, our exit out of the camp on the other side. So there's still a hippo moving around feeding. It was still a much cooler morning than we're used to so I think that's possibly why that hippo is out at the moment and just feeding, still busy grazing, trying to find some grass before it most likely leads back to some water and rests for the day or a little mud waller at the moment there's not too much water around so our plan for this morning is we are potentially going to try a different area and um, that um, where I haven't really walked yet out towards central go a little bit further east and see what we can find maybe some more birds and then obviously the little creatures uh, while we're out here I've come up onto the clearings just outside camp, just having a look to see if there's any more sign of impala and impala births like we saw the other day. And at the moment it looks like they've all moved off of the clearings already. During the course of the evening, especially last night, it was quite dark, very overcast and windy. These clearings would have been full of those impala for safety. Usually what happens is because it's nice and open and clear, they're able to keep an eye out for any predators or potential predators. So it's easier for them to get away. So these areas are ideal. Now, um, because we had a lot of rain yesterday, or quite a bit of drizzle, I'm hoping that uh, a lot of these little termite mounds and areas under, under trees and pushed over trees, there's hopefully going to be a lot of activity from little insects and maybe other little creatures. So we're going to have a good look around here. I'm heading over towards a termite mound now. And Gail, you wanted to know when will the marula fruit start uh, ripening and being ready? So the, Gail, there is some marula fruit around at the moment on some of the trees. Not a lot, however. Um, usually it's kind of middle to end of December where you really start seeing uh, ripe marula fruits and then going through into January and February. And then it's a great time of year because we can walk around, pick them up and eat them. Very rich in vitamin C, so it is a, it's a lovely little fruit to pick up when you are walking around if the elephants haven't got there first. And we know the elephants love feeding on marula fruit. And uh, we've once, I once counted an elephant uh, dung pile and they had over 200 little 
a marula fruit within that single dung pile. Often what happens is the elephants feed on the marula fruit, but they don't even bite them. They literally just swallow some of them. And these fruits will pass out in the dung completely whole. And then you'll get other animals that come and feed on it, perhaps monkeys, baboons, um, bird species. Uh, so it's, and even some of the other smaller antelope perhaps come and pick, pick around and feed on some of those marula fruits. Very, very interesting. I'm just having a look around this termite mound we've just got here. Just wanting to see if I see any activity, fresh diggings perhaps from the aardvark that we know is around in this area. Um, because we've seen tracks of aardvark before and we've seen fresh diggings. But for the moment, it doesn't like this area has been very active at all. No, I don't see any sign of fresh termite activity or any diggings around here. So this, I do think this little termite mound is potentially still active in certain areas, but it doesn't appear as if I can see a fresh hole anywhere, which is interesting. What we'll do is maybe just walk along and head to about two or three different termite mounds. And just see if we can't find anything else wandering around. We did find, uh, not too long ago, two, three days ago, we managed to find a little um, blind snake on a termite mound, burrowing inside, which was very, very interesting. And these termite mounds provide wonderful homes for many different animals, not just the termites. But as you can see, completely closed and no activity at all from any little insects. Let's see here. The other thing is usually you can tell if a termite mound is very active, you'll see a section of, of the termite mound that has been uh, repaired or rebuilt, and that section will be, the soil will be a lot darker. I'll try and look for an active one for you this morning at some stage, but um, this does not look like it's been active for a while. There hasn't been fresh ground built up again and packed closed together. So this, I'm not sure, that it's possible that there are termites active deeper down, but nothing at the surface, no activity, and this has not been active for a while. You can tell the soil is really hard and the color, coloration of the soil is very different to that of a very active termite mound. It's a beautiful morning for a bushwalk, nice and cool. It's a lovely cool breeze. The sun is coming out. I know Brent was chatting about it earlier, saying potentially it's going to be a very, very sunny day and warm up quite a bit. And I do think so. But, uh, but it is still very cool, which is lovely. So perfect conditions for a bushwalk. Oh, there goes a big dung beetle. I was hoping it would sit down for us or land, but unfortunately it just flew off. Rather large dung beetle. All right, we're going to continue on our walk. We're going to head into that area that we were speaking about. Brent has something very exciting to show you. Well, the Queen of Juma being shouted at by monkeys. There we go, look at her hunting through the bush. Hopefully she is successful this morning and brings the cubs back for a visit. those ears up alert. There could be something close by. She might have heard something, spotted something. There you go. Right, no, gonna continue on. Can you hear the monkey's alarm calling? Good morning, Karula. How are you this morning? Have you been behaving yourself? How are the children? Oh, she is looking a little hungry. Not too bad, though. 
Rex Tuck, she's about to come out into Ledward and she's heading more north now. Come straight onto Ledward. Now on Ledward Road itself. Okay, she's crossing the road now. I think she's gonna make her way towards a big termite mound over there, see if she can get some high ground. Let's try and get up ahead of her, see if she goes to that termite mound. Or is she going to change her mind just to trick us? Oh no, she's changed her mind, but uh, this is uh, fortunately for us a much nicer way to drive through. It's a little bit less thick. Okay, we're just trying to get up ahead of her so we can stop and watch her. Yeah. You okay? So she's moving through a particularly thick area, so we're just trying to get up ahead where it's a little bit more open. Watch your head, John Drat. We good? LBJ lovers out there, unfortunately, uh, the poll has said Karula wins over the little brown jobs. And in this beautiful morning light, as it warms up, I'm just going to take my jacket off. It's quite getting quite hot all of a sudden. Must be the excitement of following a leopard through the bush. Here she's coming straight towards us. I hope you guys are getting some great screenshots. Tired. Long, long, long morning of hunting so far. Now, in a way, some of this new greenery is going to suit Karula and she hunts for Diker and Stenbok, giving her a little bit more cover. And of course, if you're a baby in parlor, beware at the moment. What has she spotted? Look at that. Tails up. And off she continued. Okay, let me get my jacket off. Okay, let's go. Jacket off, ready to continue. Uh, let's have a look. What's going to be our best route? Hmm, that way. So what we're doing is we're looking for a line, and you can see there's a nice clear line through there, where we can avoid the thicker bushes and bigger trees. Watch out, John Ray. Now the trick is, when following a leopard off-road like this, especially when she's hunting, is not to stick right behind her. Now that might attract the attention if she does see something. Uh, so you try to stay off to the side. And so she's walking parallel to us. And, ooh, okay. It is getting a little bit thicker up ahead. Oh my 
monkey oranges, noisy, terrible, indestructible things. Hopefully she comes up to this termite mound here. She's running, she's running, she's just chased something. She's on that termite mound. I wonder what she saw. She just took off like a rocket. Let's get forward a bit. I wonder what she saw. Could have been a dwarf mongoose. Could have been a stenbocky. But she just dashed up and then stopped on top of the termite mound. Maybe she was just feeling young and sprightly. Um, oh dear. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna... Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just off the car. I know she's there, don't worry. I'm just fixing the fuel line. Yeah. John, do you have a screwdriver in that box or let me get my Leatherman? Okay, hang on, sorry guys. And she's going behind Rex in there. <laughs> Bush mechanic. Um, the fuel line just got caught there, but um, she's coming my side. Let me just tighten this quickly. Don't spot me, Karula. I'm sneaking back. Yeah, it's a fuel line. I've put it back on. Oh, joy. I get to smell like petrol for the rest of the safari. But we've got the fuel line back on, so we can continue. <laughs> Karula didn't even seem to notice. Is that the little tightening screw on the fuel line had come a bit loose so that popped off. So that's why we always carry tools with us. So they call it a multi purpose tool, isn't it? But I, John is going to get to enjoy the smell of gasoline for the rest of the drive, and so my, my hands are covered in it. Okay, she's going into a particularly thick block. Um, I'm going to think about how we're going to get through here. Are we going to follow Rexon and Taxon or we're we going to make our own way? Hmm. Okay, while we get through here, let's go across to Byron on foot. Watch out, Andre. Well, that's a wonderful sighting of Karula coming back this side. It's really incredible. We walk down. Uh, no, just a little track of something running across the road. Oh, and have a look. Just want to double check, have you got us now? Are we good? And now have a look at this everyone. Termites, active little termites. Wow, that is fascinating. So these are very different species of termites that we, compared to the ones we usually see in the big termite mounds. You can see these are different, but they do still have um, the little soldiers which are around here and then some of the smaller little worker termites 
Um, very, very interesting. You see how they, um, I think these are the harvested termites. I'm not entirely sure. It is a different species and they, um, but you can see what they're doing is they're taking plant material down into the, the, um, the, the hole that they've dug or, or um, excavated. See, they don't really bring out too much of the soil out and build a termite mound, but it looks like they're taking all the food down in through the hole over there. Very, very interesting behavior. And as I was saying, you probably get a lot of activity from insects like this because the soil is a lot softer now after all that rain that we had. And, um, and generally the termites do start becoming a lot more active after rain. They do need the moisture too. Really interesting to see these little insects and how busy they are. Everybody has a role and they know exactly what they need to do and all to support the colony. Very, very interesting. That's wonderful. So we're just out on the clearings close to Juma Dam at the moment. We're going to be heading across down towards the drainage line behind me. I think we can start walking in that direction so long. Um, really nice to see those termites though. And look, you wanted to know, do we travel in different areas when we are walking or do we stick to a certain area? Um, to be honest, look, it all depends on um, little things, but generally we do um, try and head into different areas. And uh, this, uh, this morning we are going into an area that we haven't really walked in for, for quite some time. Uh, so across the drainage line and onto the kind of the northeastern section. Um, but it all depends. You know, the wonderful thing with the bushwalk is you can head in different areas and each little path or each different section is very, very different. So we're going to try and cross through this thick drainage line at the moment. While we do that, let's head back to Brent, who's still with Karula. There we go, the queen of Juma sitting regally on a termite mound. I hope you guys are getting some great screenshots. Look at that beautiful morning light on her. Isn't that spectacular? Well, she's definitely on the hunt at the moment. So she might rest up here for a little bit, but I think, oh, there we go. As I said that, I said as I think she's gonna carry on. She's gonna go sneak behind Tax, just, just, uh, just to remind him. There we go, behind tax and fan. Now behind us. Oop. Okay, now she's going into this block here between Mumba Road and Ledwood Road. And this is a very difficult spot to keep with a leopard, but we will do our utmost. Definitely one of her favorite hunting areas. And fortunately, I know some sneaky, tri tricky, secret spots to cross the impossible drainage lines. Okay. Oh, not again. Right. This car sometimes decides to not like starting, but there we go, it started. She's coming up towards this little dry river system that runs between the two roads. Now, there's always generally quite a few in Yala around here. There's a, a seep line on the other side where there's often impala. You, have you still got a sight of her? West, oh dear. West is not a good direction. I uh, got it. And now, she's done this to me in this exact spot before. She goes down into this little dip and she walks through and then she comes out, okay. Um, we're going to have to go through here. Holding on.
Let's just what, see where she goes. She's in a, it's gonna be a weird angle for you, but I just need to see where she goes from the thickets to, to plan our, our next maneuver. Hello, Karolski. Oh, she's dropping. Oops. Okay. Uh, and let me just get hold of taxi quickly. I film taxi to Nyinginyama and Nyingimnis. Okay, so now this is where it gets a bit tricky because there is a way, I'm just trying to remember. So there's a very steep drop off here. So I'm just, there she is, she's coming back towards us. So there we go. Good girl. You've chosen the easiest of the three options for us to follow you. Now she's using these little culverts or rain runoff areas to mask her approach. Now it's also an area where a diker might hide its baby. So she's just checking under the little log falls. Okay, now She's gonna go down in, oh no, she's gonna have a scent mark first. Oh. Making sure that if any other leopard, female leopard comes into Syria, they know that this is her territory. Okay, Jandre, how brave are you feeling? Because now it's time to do some technical driving. I'm excited. And fortunately, as I said, I know some secret spots around here. Um, we've had Karula sightings in this area quite often before, and it is sometimes a bit of a challenge to keep up with her. Jandre, just keep an eye on her for me while I try to find a way down this bank. Can you still see her? No two of you lost sight. Oh, Chandra, you failed in your one job I give you. I mean, forget all the camera operating. I just told you to watch the leopard. Okay, we're gonna have to go around to get down there. Okay, so uh, we're gonna try get down into that drainage. And while we do that, let's go see what's happening with the lions. This morning our big cats are leading us all over the show, but luckily your timing is perfect because we're going to have a really, really beautiful view in a second. Just have a look at this. I'm going to stop here for now just to give you an idea of just how stunning this moment is now. Uh, we're going to be leaving these lines, I think, in the not too distant future. I've heard a report coming through from Cheetah Plains, so I might be ducking off in that direction in the not too distant future. But for now, we have this incredible view of the lions in the golden sunlight. She's sought refuge on top of a termite mound, shame girl. <laughs> now apparently I've just heard that somewhere to the west of us, so probably either on Arethusa or Simbambili, which are two of the properties to the west of us, the Inkahumas have killed something. They have a kill, I don't know what it is, it's probably a buffalo, um, just statistically in terms of the Inkahumas, and that's where she's trying to go. She's just constantly pushing west until he stops her, at which point she lies down. And then she carries on again. As soon as he starts to really settle, she continues to move. But he's just blocking her at the moment. Amber Eyes, the one thing I must say that I'm so thrilled, this is the first time I've properly seen Amber Eyes moving in quite a long time. And I must say, I'm absolutely thrilled to see how much better she's looking. There was one moment a couple of days ago where I was particularly concerned about her and the other lioness just in terms of their ability to walk and the way in which they were struggling. Their back legs were floppy. The males have been absolutely fine. Um, Mufumo has, so, has been totally strong since his face healed up. 
but amber eyes was not and it's really wonderful to see that whatever they ate obviously did them the world of good one of those buffalo clearly had what they needed and what they were missing from their diet because she was back up, she's back up and walking perfectly which is very very good to see hey amber you okay again my girl yes I don't think she's going to stop moving until the time comes that she reaches the rest of the pride. And she will continue to try and push him in that direction. Sometimes lionesses are not successful in getting back to their pride until they've finished their Easter cycle or their mating with the males. But sometimes they are. And then what will happen is she'll try and go and greet the rest of the pride. He'll keep blocking her. Sometimes there's a little bit of a skirmish or a fight between the members of the pride and the male. And they get frustrated with him, he gets frustrated with them, he's very protective over the female that he's with. And as I said earlier this morning on the Sunrise Safari, to the point that he might even um, attack one of the females for getting too close. But hopefully it is a peaceful reunion, and it just progresses in the way that it always has done. Right, now that we've had a chance to get the view, let's go a little bit closer. We've been through some interesting, interesting vegetation, and it's been a while since I've been as relieved as I am that Wendy's tires are new. Otherwise, we might be hopping off and changing a tire, but I think we're going to make it through just fine. It was sicklebush country. Sicklebush is a type of tree with a very solid thorn. It's actually not a thorn, it's called a spine because it's a modified branch and therefore is much more solid than a thorn. And it can be a flat tire central moving through an area like this. But I think we've been successful. Hello, my girl. And you too, boy. But mainly Amber Eyes, because I'm relieved to see that she's okay. Happy? Awesome. Yeah, gorgeous. You're looking very regal on the top of your termite mound there. Now, Beck, on the subject of our very glamorous lioness, she looks like she's all set up for a photo shoot, the way that she's lying. You want to know if Amber Eyes is the oldest of the lionesses? She's not. There is one other lioness that is older than Amber Eyes, and that is, from what we understand, I mean, I haven't, as I said, I haven't been here, so I can't speak from first-hand experience, but they are all the daughters or the relatives of the one oldest female of the Inkahumas. She is, if you've been watching, I don't know how long you've been watching for Beck, and I must say a very warm welcome. Um, Beck, if you've been watching over the last few weeks, the oldest female has a broken tipped canine. She's missing the tip of one of her canines. She's got a very dark black nose, and she is the mother of the middle set of cubs. She is the oldest of the lionesses in the Inkohuma pride, and quite a relatively easily recognizable one. We have followed the progress. So the, the Inkohuma pride as it stands consists of that oldest female, Amber Eyes, two youngish females that are probably sisters with the dotty noses. They are the other two mothers of the current set of cubs. And then one young lioness that has only just reached sexual maturity now. So she's only recently in the last few months started to mate. Now that's the Inkahuma pride. Plus of course there's six surviving cubs. <laughs> He's snoozing away quite happily not concerned about moving anywhere. He's just biding his time until she's ready. And they could be like this for quite a while now. It's not too hot though this morning. And we'll just have to wait and see whether or not they decide to keep moving. Uh, she's definitely trying to get to the rest of the pride. And it's amazing how they always know exactly where they are, or at least where the others are, in terms of their movements. She knows where the rest, they must have been roaring, and we just weren't quite able to hear it from where we were.
Her scar on her shoulders healed up. Uh, a little bit earlier, we saw the two of them roaring, and the big male, she was sort of sitting upright, but the big male was roaring with his head up, and then he flopped down onto his side. And we see them do that regularly. Virginia, you want to know if they're if the lion's roar travels further if the lion is lying flat on the ground. That's the theory, yes. Um, the idea is that it, it sort of bounces off the ground and that it travels through the ground and that it helps it to travel further and that that is why the lions roar, the lions often roar lying down. It's the theory. Um, it's, it's not 100% proved to be exactly the case. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I suppose p the people who've come up with that theory have been studying for many years and are probably much cleverer than myself, so it's probably true. I don't know, though. To me, a roar sounds louder just from my own ears when I am, when the lion's standing up. That being said, I've got human ears, don't I? And I'm not necessarily capable of picking up some of the lower frequency sounds and the softer sounds that perhaps lions in other areas would be able to pick up upon. We do know that their roar, uh, regardless, will travel several kilometers. On colder days, it'll tra travel further. On warmer days, slightly less. I wonder if they know that or if they just roar. I think they probably just roar. And through this morning's various uh, vocal activities, he will know exactly where the other members of his pride are, even if we don't. Oh, so tentative. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Just checking you're still here. Just making sure that you haven't snuck off while I wasn't looking. But not quite brave enough to risk a smack in the face. And they do often get smacked in the face, the male lions, when they are slightly too forward. Uh, Ellen, you want to know if it was normal what we heard earlier, just in terms of the male and the female contact calling together. It is. Uh, lions also follow the same sort of instinctive approach that something like a babbler might, which is a type of bird, which is it's basically where as soon as one starts the others will continue and I don't think we've ever ever had a sighting she's roaring because she wants to know where the rest of the pride is he's roaring because she roared essentially and it would work the other way around as well so if he started roaring to contact call to his buddies um, as part of the coalition or as a territorial announcement or both at the same time she would join in as well now you never are in a situation where lions start to roar and one of them or two of them just sit there going eh, i don't really feel like it this morning and i think i'm just going to keep my mouth shut as soon as one starts they will they will continue to call and there might be a minute or two gap in between but most of the time it's almost immediately afterwards one will start the next will go the next will go in a sort of a chain reaction and as i described earlier this morning that instinct extends to the cubs as well so they know they're meant to be joining in they don't quite have the size or the the voice box development just yet to really really give it their, but they do give it their all they do try very hard it's adorable And Janine, you want to know how you pronounce the name of the male. <laughs> Amber eyes, of course, is a relatively simple one. <laughs> but the male's name, M-F-U-M-O, for our, for our new viewers, M-F-U-M-O, 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 is the name of this particular male. So M-F-U-M-O, the authority. I love that name. It has such a ring to it. And it sounds like a lion's roar as well. Unintentionally, but it kind of to me. Don't you think? Flop. Are you still there? Amber? Are you ready yet? Can I mate yet? Yes? No? No. Not quite ready. I just had such a serious deja vu moment. It was so weird. I don't know where it came from. 
uh, some strange memory of sitting in here with lions, this exact termite mound. It must have been months ago. It could even have been over a year ago. But I've just had a really seriously strong sense of deja vu. That or my brain just skipped a beat and got confused. But I just, somewhere in the, something's tingling in the back of my mind. And our sightings do occasionally, apart from the ones that really stand out, our moments in time kind of blend into a mixture of things and we never know exactly when something happened or we know exactly where we were but we just don't remember exactly when it happened or what exactly was going on at the time. I'm going to need to chat a little bit on the Game Drive channel. So while I do that, let's go over to Byron and see how his morning stroll is treating him. So I've been walking around. We've managed to cross through two deep drainage lines, quite thick areas. So we've got to be very, very careful when we do cross through those areas. For animals like buffalo and elephant, especially that might be feeding on the green vegetation around there. So we're always scanning very, very carefully. We've come up onto an area, bit of a crest that's a little bit of a higher area, still fairly thick though. I've managed to find something quite interesting over here. Now, I'm not sure what has happened, but here are the remains of a dung beetle and it's definitely been eaten by something and uh, just wanting there's part of the shell too look at that so maybe something like a um i don't know maybe a little mongoose or something that's possibly fed on this dung beetle or maybe even a bird i'm not entirely sure here's another dung beetle that appears to be alive but it's barely alive have a look at that very very interesting so i'm not sure what happened here if it was also attacked look how stiff the legs on very large beetle oh there we go moving a little bit oh, no it's fine perhaps it was just feigning death i've never seen it do that before or dung beetle do that before but look at that very very large it just froze and then now it's fine again that was very interesting maybe just having a nap <laughs> I will start looking for some food. There's no fresh dung around here, unfortunately, so we'll probably have to move quite far. That's nice, wonderful, lovely to see. You. But it's such strange behavior, I've never seen that before. It just froze, completely stiff, and then now it's decided to move off and it's just hiding under a few blades of grass. So, as I was saying, while we are walking through these thicker areas, we need to not necessarily just keep an eye out, but also listen very, very carefully for any potential animals that might be around. Um, because usually, while we're walking, you might not necessarily see the animals, but you could hear, you could hear um, perhaps elephants breaking branches, Buffalo may be, may be moving through the areas, um, also with oxpeckers sitting on a lot of these animals. You'll hear the oxpeckers first before you actually see, see what it is. So if you do hear oxpeckers or any other birds alarm calling, perhaps if it's a predator, you need to always be very, very aware of that while you are on a walk. It sounds like Brent is back with Karula on a termite mound. Let's go have a look. Well, we've never left Karula. We've just been keeping up with her and going through some very difficult areas. But it definitely has been worth it. Chandra, quickly, yeah. on the dashboard, there we've got some mating little beetles. Oh, why she's going up a tree? What are you doing, Karula? Mm. 
Jandre is upset because I made him miss her jumping to look at beetles. Oh, and now they've fallen off. That's Okay, well, looks like she's using the tree as a vantage point. Now, during winter, she wouldn't really need to do this, but now with the, the greenery thickening up. There we go, look at that. Oh, it's gonna take a break. It's been a tough morning. Now, what she did there, she's using the marula tree as a vantage point. There are normally quite a lot of Inyala and Impala in this area, but we ha she hasn't seen any yet. And it could be because of how thick the, the bush is. So, she's using it as a bit of a high point. I'm just going to move a little bit so Rex can fit in next to me. Here we go, jean -Dray. There we go. She's using that high point, having a quick look around. She might rest there. It looks like quite a nice marula tree to rest. Turtle Trekkin would like to know, how far she will move away from her cubs while she's out hunting. She'll sometimes move or leave them for up to three days, but she can leave them as far as 10 kilometers away in her travels, and that's not unusual at all. It's nice to catch up with her. She's been giving us a slip over the last couple of days. We've found her tracks, we've found this, she crosses south, she comes back, she sneaks in, she sneaks out. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But at least we, we got her this morning. So let's hope she does manage to make a kill up here in the north today. And that will cause her to bring those cubs back. Come on, look this way, Queen Karools. Oh, here comes that brilliant African light. You can see the leaves being illuminated in the background as the clouds dissipate and the great deluge of 2016 was less than five millimeters. Sand Looks like she's going to have a little cat nap. Uh, 
Isn't that stunning? I hope you guys are getting some great screenshots. Remember to share them. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or pop them on our Facebook page, Safari Live, or on one of the many uh, wonderful viewer groups on Facebook where you guys share your screenshots from the drives. Oh, that's going to be a good one. tear on the queen for a leopard of her age. Now it's not uncommon for a leopard to take a break while hunting, uh, cool down, chill out and then get moving again a little later. Definitely nap time now. Just having a morning uh, equivalent of a human's morning tea break or morning coffee break. Turtle Trekkin is wondering what is that bird we hear? Is it alarm calling? It's not. Uh, it's, it's just calling. Um, a it sounds like one of the little fly catchers. I'll try to get a view of it. Let's just move forward a little bit while Karula's not looking this way. See if we can get a visual of that very, very loud bird, very rude, interrupting our leopard sighting. Ah, uh, don't. F off it goes. It is one of the little fly catchers. Um, not sure which one. Quite a lot of their calls sound quite similar. Oh, Karula's looking the other way. I'm trying to think, should we move around to the other side? But the problem is, as soon as you do that, she pops her head through this side. So I think patience is the name of the game. Her eyes are closed, so she is a napping. Oh, there you go, head down now. A convenient marula for having a napping. That's the that's the, the risk. If you move around to the other side, when she lifts her head, she's looking this way. So, staying put, vindicated. Remember, this is 100% live. You're looking at one of the most elusive predators in Africa, live from South Africa. And if you want to ask us any questions about this incredibly beautiful creature, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or send us an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Has she spotted something? Now I can hear some oxpeckers off in that direction. Maybe that's what attracted her attention. Could there be some Anyala or Impala off to the north of us? Oh, it's nap time again. Well, Karula makes up her mind about what to do. Uh, let's go across to Byron, who's got something you don't want to find in your shoe. <laughs> now we did um, we did have a scorpion that we wanted to show you, but it seems to have disappeared. Where was it? A beautiful little scorpion, quite a venomous one, very thick tail. But it was a tiny, tiny little scorpion, and it's just disappeared. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing <laughs> that we don't know where the scorpion's gone. <laughs> um, it's disappeared on us. 
Oh well, we might be able to find another one. Yeah, no, it looks like it's gone. Probably just hiding away from us. It's amazing how these little creatures can disappear so quickly. Beautiful bird calling up ahead. Let's see, it's the Steelings Wren Warbler. And I think Brent got to see one yesterday on our birding day. I've got a beautiful, beautiful call. Oh, there we go. It had tried to dig itself down under the log, but there's the little scorpion. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful little scorpion. Very, very sharp sting and very thick tail. Do you see that? Now, if I put my finger, you can see the size. Let's hope it doesn't sting me. But the size difference, very small little scorpion. Thin pincers. Now, scorpions are basically, basically split into two groups. Um, within the scorpion family and what the one group generally and this is a very broad um, generalization but what happens is you have these little ones with the very very thin pincers I'm actually not going to bother too much it's now gone back underneath I think it's just trying to look for shelter so you have scorpions with very very thin pincers like that one thin pincers with a thick thick tail um, now those scorpions are generally the more venomous ones they've got a lot of venom in that sting and they rely on their venom um, and their sting to to sting and obviously kill their prey that they will then feed on. The other group of scorpions have got very, very thick pincers with a much thinner tail. They also have venom, so all scorpions have got venom. However, these scorpions rely on those powerful pincers to catch insects and feed on them. They may use the sting at times, but generally use on the powerful, powerful pincers to catch and grab prey. So that's generally the two groups of scorpions that you get. If you come across a scorpion and it's got a very thick tail and thin pincers, stay far away because those ones will give you a very, very nasty sting. Now we've got two, two species of scorpions in southern Africa that are, are the most venomous and they fall under the Parabuthus genus. Now Parabuthus um, basically distinguishes those scorpions with the very thick tails and the thin pincers. Now in this area we have a Parabuthus transvalicus, which is quite a large black scorpion very very thick black tail and if those sting you if you especially if you're a young young person a child perhaps you may need medical attention need to get to hospital very very quickly very very strong powerful venom cytotoxic venom um, and uh, is it neurotoxic too I think if I'm not mistaken and um, and those uh, so the, the the sting area itself will be very very painful, but the neuro uh, neurotoxic venom will affect the nervous system, which is not ideal. The um, the other one is the Parabuthus uh, granulatus, which is a very large brown scorpion that's found found generally northwestern part of South Africa up in the desert areas and obviously that camouflage that brown coloration helps it camouflage very very well in that sandy soil now those are the most venomous in southern Africa and you do not want to be stung by those those will probably put you in hospital um, apparently it is the worst thing to possibly experience your whole body convulse, uh, convulses nauseous um, and it's just a painful 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 experience so um but those are generally the two species other scorpion species will just give you a really nasty sting and it will be very very painful for a while and then it generally wears off all right we're going to continue and see what else we can find but that was a nice little sighting let's head back to that beautiful female leopard and brent Well, she is a uh, fast, fast asleep. Look at that. She has decided that this hunting malarkey is just too much effort for the morning. And she's decided that this marula tree is the perfect spot for a catnap. Look at that. Ideal branch for her.
Hi Mia. Mia is wondering, do we have fig trees in this area that the leopards use? Well on Juma there are very very few fig trees. Uh, in other parts of the Sabi Sands there are fig trees that leopards will utilize. In our part of the world the main trees they utilize are marula trees, uh, weeping boar bean trees and jackalberry trees are their favorites. Those are the, the main ones but a leopard will use any tree that's of the right sort of size and close enough. Uh, she does pop her eyes open and have a look around every now and then in case there's an, an impala on the seep line or a nyala moving through the woodland. She is hungry, so she is definitely not maybe done with hunting just yet. She might still hunt. What have you spotted, Madame Karula? get those eyelids get heavy again. Now leopards are incredibly adaptable, the most adaptable of all big cats and can be found in a huge variety of areas from true desert up to alpine moorland. But their favorite or the best area for them is sort of mixed savanna uh, and low fault savanna. And this part of the world's got some of the biggest leopards ever recorded. Oh, look at those eyes. She just opens them. Stunning. And as quick as they open, off they go. Now isn't this amazing, if you look at the ancient Greek, uh, the leopard was originally thought to be a hybrid between a lion and a panther. Of course a black panther is just a menalistic leopard and, and definitely not at all related to a lion. And the second part of the scientific name, of course it's a panthera cat, and pardus is thought to come from ancient Egyptian, which would have been their word for a leopard. What are you looking at? I can't see anything behind us, but she does keep checking through. There is a big seep line up there that's often got nice big herds of impala on it. Now a leopard is a synonymous with Africa, but is also very common throughout Asia. And some of the biggest leopard densities in the world occur outside of Africa, uh, Sri Lanka having one of them. Now the original sort of ancestor of the leopard evolved about six and a half million years ago in Asia and it probably and migrated from Asia into Africa so leopards were originally an Asiatic species but they managed to colonize the whole of Africa over the last sort of six million years all the way although they're very very rare now in North Africa uh, most of them have been shot out and in Egypt Morocco those areas but as we move further down, still quite prevalent in the, the Sahil area, Chad, um, and then very, very stable still in the rainforests of Central Africa. And then of course through the different savanna biomes and Miombo broadleafed woodland and into the deserts. So incredible, incredibly adaptable species. Uh, covering the ma vast majority of Africa. The only place you really don't find them is in the true, true driest of the dry deserts.
Now, out of all the other big cats, initially, leopards were thought to be most closely related to lions, but uh, on analysis of the mitochondrial DNA, it turns out that their closest living relative is a snow leopard, which would make sense. Now, leopards actually survived in Europe up until not that long ago, but only in, if I remember correctly, it was Portugal and Spain. There was a, a tiny, tiny population uh, of uh, leopards that survived there for quite a long time before becoming extinct. Now, of course, leopards not only in Asia, but they occur all the way through into Russia, uh, Afghanistan, uh, or most of the stands to Mekistan. And there is rumours that there still might be some leopards left in Turkey. Uh, but I'd be very surprised if they haven't become extinct. Yeah, she's looking back up towards those seep lines around Drakensberg Road and there might not be anything there or well, there might we don't know but she hasn't looking like she's gonna jump down at any time soon remember this is hundred percent live and you can ask us questions by using the hashtag Safari live or questions at wildearth.tv Okay, we're gonna sit here and wait to see what the queen gets up to next while we do that. Uh, let's go see what Byron's doing while he beats about the bush. Have a look at have a look at this everyone so remember I said it's interesting always interesting to check termite mounds you might get some interesting activity from animals and look at this a snake has shed its skin inside the termite mound and I managed to pull it out um, and it's quite whole which is wonderful hang on I just want to try to show you how long it is so that's the head over there and the tail I think there's a portion of this skin missing but uh, that's a fairly decent size snake. I do, why I say I think there's a section of it missing? Because the skin is quite thick, so the body would have been thick, so I think the snake was longer. Um, and to be honest, this looks like a Mozambican spitting cobra uh, um, skin. I think that's potentially what shed here in this termite mound. And uh, it found a perfect little area, so it was in here. I'm just going to leave that over there for now, but and maybe just make sure that the snake isn't around. But um, but it was inside this little entrance to the termite mound, and we've spoken about it before. How many different animals use termite mounds for homes? And exactly that's what's happened here now. This uh, snake has come into the termite mound at some point. It's a safe place for it to shed its skin. And it shed and then probably moved on and moved away. It would be wonderful to see a Mozambican spitting cobra. They are beautiful snakes. You do have to be careful though. Obviously that venom that they are able to spit very, very well.
<laughs> Betsy, darling, you'd like to know what animals or insects get into our rooms back at camp. Well, we've got to be careful and we've got to generally try to keep doors and windows closed for most parts of the day. Um, but probably the one insect is the mosquitoes. Lots and lots of mosquitoes around at the moment. Uh, we do have to be careful and look out for snakes. Not often, but they can occasionally come into camp. I know working at a camp a few years ago when I worked permanently in the bush and we used to see a lot and a lot of uh, snakes coming into camp but in and around camp not necessarily in the rooms so don't worry everyone not in the rooms but close to the camps uh, between the rooms or um, or maybe outside the offices and that and uh, one of the snakes we used to see re quite regularly were the Mozambique and spitting cobras and often I had to go in and, and catch them and try and take them out and they do spit hence the name spitting cobra and the venom if you do get that venom in your eye or, or, um, or perhaps on an area of your body where you have a cut and it's able to get into your bloodstream then you could potentially be in some serious danger if it just gets on your skin it stings a little bit the venom it doesn't really harm you you just wash it off with water or if you get it in your eye what you need to do is go and rinse your your eye out with water for for half an hour just lie there and just keep rinsing keep rinsing and usually it just uh, it, it gets washed out um, the interesting thing with the Mozambique and spitting cobra is that it doesn't necessarily have to raise its body up and spit its venom. Some cobras, what they do is they raise up and when they spit, they actually throw the venom. So they do this movement and they fling the venom towards whatever um, predator it is around that they're trying to um, force away. With the Mozambique and spitting cobra, it's able to spit from a fairly low position because what it does is it contracts muscles in the, in the skull or around the face and that enables it to spray the venom out. It's a lot more accurate and it can spray the venom out as opposed to having to actually fling the venom towards you. So you do have to be careful of them and I know in the past when I've gone to go and try and catch them and get them out just always make sure you have a pair of sunglasses on um, and then obviously snake tongs. Now the golden rule is doesn't matter what snake it is, even if you think you recognize it, rather not pick it up because if they do bite you, if something happens and you're out in the bush, chances are you're going to find yourself in some hot water because you're far away from medical attention or perhaps medical attention you need and um, and it's just not worth it. So generally the, the rule is if you see a snake, view them, enjoy them, but don't try and go and pick them up and and disturb them. Ellen, you want to know if snakes have their own territory. Most definitely, Ellen. Um, snakes will have uh, territories as such. And something like this Mozambican spitting cobra that was in here, I'm sure that this is its territory. It would most likely be moving around within this area looking for food. Another, another animal that's very territorial, another snake, is the, um, is the black mamba. They do tend to be quite territorial. And within their territory, they'll probably have a number of uh, number of burrows or or little holes that they will um, move to. So yeah, they can be territorial at times. Pythons, pythons are probably also fairly territorial, staying within an area. James, you wanted to know if any animals such as birds would make use of the snake skin? No, n not at all. And, um, and I say that because I've seen snake skins many times in the bush. Nothing actually uses it. There's no use for this at all. It's just a shed, that's all. There's absolutely no use for this to any animal. Nothing will eat it or anything like that. I mean, you might get might get little beetles or something that come and feed on it, but generally, no. That's why the snake skins often, when you do find a shed, they stay intact for very, very long periods of time. Nothing actually goes and feeds on it or uses it for anything. Let's see. Well, that's really, really interesting. Nice to see that in the termite mound. And we'll continue away from there and see what else we can find. Now again, just moving further through this area, it is still fairly thick, so we need to keep our 
our eyes open and our eyes peeled for any animals but I've been speaking quite a bit and generally what happens is if animals do hear you and hear your voices they possibly move away from the area and away from you but that's not to say that they're not going to be around all right so we're going to continue walking through this area and while we do that Jamie's on the road again while Byron gets through the area that he's in I am racing across to Cheetah Plains not backwards of course I'm going backwards because I just saw something in the road I wonder they must have found her today that's Tundi's tracks in the road with what looks like let me just try and see. Let me see if there's cubs as well. Tundi is a female leopard. I'm not going to stop and get out, unfortunately. You'll just have to take my word for it that those are leopard tracks, which they are. And it looks as though there might be two sets there. So Tundi and her gorgeous cub, whom I still have not actually properly seen. And they cross straight south into Chitwa. I hope that she is happy and well wherever she happens to be on Chitwa. I'll try and find out from some of the other guides once I get onto Cheetah Plains exactly where it is she is. And those tracks are from last night, early this morning, so they're relatively fresh. Just unfortunately on this main road they've been already they've been driven over. Right, no time to delay I'm afraid. We're almost reaching the end of the sunset safari. We've got less than an hour left and I've got to be somewhere. Sunrise safari. Sunrise safari. Thank you, Gert. I don't know why I can never get those two things straight. When I first started working here, it was always the sunshine safari, which actually, sunshine safari is not a bad name. At least then I wouldn't get confused between sunrise and sunset. But it's apparently only me that has that problem, so, you know, maybe there's no point to changing establishment just because I can't remember the difference between a sunrise and a sunset. It is more here in South Africa and therefore this is the sunrise safari not the sunset safari but we're speeding around the corner into Cheetah Plains and while we race to where we're going let's go back to the magnificent Queen of Juma with Brent well she still hasn't managed to come down the tree Still looking up towards the seep lines on Drakensberg Road, but obviously she's not spotting anything that's struck her fancy just yet. Oh, there you go, those eyes closed again. Still looking quite comfortable. Big yawn. <laughs> oh, let's have a look. I can't see. There could be Impala nah, behind us. I said there's a nice seep line there. She's constantly checking, checking, checking in between her bouts of napping. His ears are also moving, listening. Hi, Dale, who's a new viewer. A big warm welcome to a sunny safari live this morning. Dale would like to know, oh, sorry, Dale, the sun is right in my eyes. Um, Dale would like to know, um, do any of the big cats, leopards in particular, see in color? They don't. They all see in various shades of gray and white. Oh, gray and black, gray and white. Now, uh, they also don't see in detail. Their eyes are specifically designed to pick up movement, so they don't see very small details, but they're able to pick up the slightest movement, and that is how they hunt. So while she scans from her high vantage point, she'll be looking for any movement that could signify the presence of an impala or an inyala. But at the moment, she's eyes are closed and she's 
uh, having a nap in a lovely shady marula tree. A peaceful morning. You can hear the rattling cesticulars chirping away. Brown crown chagra calling as well. And the not so nice meh of a <laughs> birchal starling. One of the different calls of an orange-breasted bushwhack as well, in the distance. Noisy birds this morning. Well, hello, Joanne, another new and very excited viewer. Joanne is wondering, how old is Karula? Oh, what's she now, 11, turning 12, I think. So she's a relatively old leopard. Uh, she's got two cubs presently, but she's left them to the south while she goes hunting. And uh, she's our dominant female that we get here on Juma. And uh, hopefully she's gonna come down the tree and see what she can find shortly. There she is. So, Joanne, a big safari live welcome to you. Dustin's wondering, would a leopard ever hunt from a tree? Uh, Dustin, they do, but it is unusual for them to leap from a tree onto an animal. Uh, there is quite a lot of high risk in terms of injury from doing that, but they do do it in certain parts, and you must remember these animals are opportunistic. If an opportunity arises for an easy meal, if she had to leap out of a tree, she definitely wouldn't turn it down. Quite nice, just pleasantly sitting here, listening to the birds, watching the queen as she surveys. Oh, look at that. See that slight little movement in her head? Maybe she has spotted something. Now the area she's looking through is quite, to is quite thick. It could be a nyala, could be impala, it could even be a stenbok or a diker. Or it could be a big hippo, yes. Unlikely though. <laughs> Oh, she is focusing again. No, she's lost interest again. So obviously false alarm. There is a herd of elephants I can hear in there as well. You can hear them breaking their branches. Oh, stitch. Does that mean it's time to get on the move or time to go back to sleep, madam? Mm, I think it's time to have another nap. As we know, Karula does do quite a lot of hunting during the day. So it's possible she might not be right here come sunset safari. We're going to see her to wait if the queen comes down and uh, goes off to something. Or is she just going to snooze? While we do that, let's go see how Byron's doing on foot.
So I'm going to take this snakeskin back with us so we've got something else for the tent, which could be very interesting. I'm sure James will be happy with me for bringing it back. Now, have a look at this, though. This is very interesting on this marula tree. A lot of mud, very, very high up. Now, just to give you an idea, I'm stretching, and it's still another 30 or 40 centimeters above me. And what's happened here is it's mud that has been scraped up against the tree. I'm sure a lot of you are, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I'm sure a lot of you are, um, are guessing already what this might be from. And mud is so high up on a tree can only be one animal, and that's elephant. So an elephant has come through this area. It's interesting because there's no water hole or mud wallow or anything in the, around here. And um, so elephants obviously splashed up or, or water or mud on itself during the course of, a day, of the day and walked past and then used this tree as a little rubbing post. Just stood and probably scraped and scratched itself and left all this mud on the side of the tree. It's incredible. Robin, getting back to the marula fruit and how the elephants feed on them because they or they enjoy them so much. You wanted to know, do they actually chew them at times? Do they get any nutrients from it? Yes, definitely, Robin, they do. So, I mean, they, as I said, a lot of the fruit passes straight through the elephant. However, uh, there are elephants, I mean, when elephants are feeding, there's definitely a chance of them biting those fruits and actually feeding on the fruits and just the pips coming out um, in the dung uh, or the seeds. But uh, yes, definitely they will get some nutrients from it. It's very rich in, I mean, the vitamin C and that from what we know. And uh, there are obviously other nutrients within that fruit too that the elephants will benefit from. But I think uh, one of the main reasons they feed on it is because it's so sweet. So it's a different flavor as opposed to the dry vegetation that they constantly feed on. So that would be something really nice for them to, to eat. Almost like a little treat, I suppose you could say. That's why they enjoy feeding on them in the summer when they are around. And uh, we can see some more sign of elephant around here. The elephant has pushed over, pushed over this little, this tree. And uh, I'm assuming what's happened here is let's have a look. So this marula has probably been pushed over so that the elephant can feed on the branches high up and they do do that I've seen it before I've seen a big bull elephant go and push over a tree and actually the rest of the herd come around and feed on these leaves on the trees on the branches right up at the top so unfortunately this marula looks like it is dead it didn't survive it's been pushed over completely and um, and the elephants most likely fed on it when they did push it over. And it's incredible to see how they push these trees over. What they would do is the elephants, and I've seen it a few times, elephant will walk up to a tree and one like this would be easy for an elephant to push over, this massive, massive tree. And what happens is as they walk up to the tree, um, they'll put their tusks on either side they lift their trunk up actually surprisingly enough you'd think that they just use their forehead but they don't they lift their trunk up and they rest the trunk against the I mean, so I'm not going to push the tree over don't worry <laughs> but they lift their trunk up against the side of the tree and what they do is they then rock and they do one two and usually two or three little just feeling it out and then they go and they push the entire tree over and then they just lean into it and they push the tree over like that it's incredible to see incredible to see how powerful they are to be able to do that i don't want to damage the snake stick that i'm carrying I'm trying to get it back in one piece some wonderful bird calls around us too while we're walking um, and some of them are a little bit too far for you to hear but birds like the oh sorry hang on have a look at this beautiful butterfly oh stay don't go 
<laughs> there, here we go. It's just sat down again, landed. Look at that. Now I'm not sure what butterfly this is. And there are so many species of butterfly and generally the more common ones we do get to know but uh, occasionally you see a new colorful one or not occasionally regularly you see new butterflies and it's not always easy to identify them and they see really study butterflies and go and spend hours learning and trying to find out which families they come from it's quite tricky and a lot of scientific names and big scientific words and i have sat with some um uh, some professors who study uh, study butterflies and um, and spoken to them and listened to a few talks but it does get very confusing oh, there's a wonderful bird call coming from behind us unfortunately it's a uh, it's a bit too far I don't think you'll hear it it's called a Retz's helmet strike um, and I can't, I can't do the call, unfortunately. It's a very strange call. There's also a black-headed oriole calling not too far. Um, in the trees, in the big marulas off to our left. But uh, we're going to continue through this thicket, try and make our way through the drainage line again, heading back towards the camp. And let's head back to Brent and that beautiful female leopard karula. Well, she leapt down the marula tree and was on the move again. That's why we were waiting with her. Uh, she came down very quickly. She's now already probably 50 meters from where she was. And she's just stopping on the termite mound to have a quick look at what's around. You can see after the rain, the flies are out in force and her ears are flicking at a rate of knots. Nice smelly guari bush for a scent mark. Keep coming down Mamba Road, Ephraim. You'll get my visual. I'm to the north of the road. Oh, can you smell that, Chandra? The very strong buttered popcorn smell of the leopard scent mark. Green Gorilla, why did you choose this particular direction? This is possibly the worst area to follow a leopard on the whole of Juma. Ephraim, she's still from the north into the block. Um, once you get past that uh, Marula right next to the road where she was, just switch off um, and you'll get my audio. big stumps everywhere. Now, one of my favorite leopards and Karula's last successful letter, Mr. Quarantine and or both of them and Mr. Kunuma like to take us on goose chases through this particular area. Often left us, oh where'd she go? Often left the cameraman and presenters full of thorns, oh there she is. Ephraim's trying to find us. If you got my audio. Oh dear. This is not a particularly fun place to drive. Oh, it looks like she goes there. We've got a little bit of a route through. This is quite a nice hunting area for her as she. sneaks through.
There we go, she stopped listening intently. Watch some doves fly into the tree. Those alert ears. Wonder if she heard something. Don't think so. I think she's just being diligent as she moves through the bush. Mm. Thorns, 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 thorns everywhere. You're out of the way? Okay, well, I think while we try not to get hooked on every thorn in the bush, let's go see what Byron's up to. <laughs> oh dear, Brent, you sound like you're getting yourself into a bit of trouble over there. Now, while we're walking around, we're also noticing a lot of different little flowers that started to come into bloom. Um, so, most of them are very difficult to identify. You need to walk around with the flower book. I'm not sure what flower this is actually, um, but beautiful nonetheless. Um, I really have no idea. I don't think I've seen that little one before. But very, very beautiful. Nice to see these little flowers around. Some of the more common flowers and probably moving further into summer we'll start seeing a lot more flowers around. An area that has got wonderful flowers is the Kalahari Desert, believe it or not. And certain times of year after a lot of rainfall you get all these flowers blooming and it, it looks incredible in that desert landscape. All that sandy soil and all these flowers around them, very, very beautiful. There's another little one over here. Now this little one, I think I do know, this appears to be part of the foxglove family. Look at that beautiful pink flower. And I think this is part of the foxglove family. I see there's some ants raiding this little flower. I'm not sure why. Potentially trying to get something sweet off of the flower. Perhaps there's some um, um, some nectar or something around the flowers that they're trying to get to. That could potentially be why these ants are raiding that flower on the flower. Uh, while I'm walking, I'm just having a look around for any other interesting little plants and flowers and trees. And this is an interesting one. And this is known as an ivy grape, this little bush over here. And uh, the ivy grape is a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a vine almost. And and let's see if it's. Um, I don't see any of the grapes, but they do get little grapes, and apparently you can feed, you can eat them. I haven't tried them because the flowers don't smell very good, or the leaves don't smell very good. So I always think that something that doesn't smell good probably can't have tasty fruit. But I'm not sure. Maybe further into summer we'll find some ripe ones and try the ivy grape. It sounds like Jamie is back from Cheetah Plains. Let's head over to her and get an update. <music> On the southeastern corner of our Traverse area, we are back once again with one of the newest or some of the newest arrivals in terms of our various lions, the two 
gorgeous little Styx cubs and their wonderful mum. Uh, we had a chance to see them not too long ago, very briefly, because I was being thoroughly rained upon, and Genre and myself had to beat a hasty retreat back to Juma. But now the sun is shining, and we have got as much time as we do until the end of the sun's sunrise safari to spend with them. And for now, they've found themselves in a nice patch of shade, and have settled down having some breakfast from mum. And this will be a really nice opportunity because hopefully they're going to start waking up once they've had their breakfast and perhaps playing with each other. We'll have a proper chance to see their faces and also to see how they're doing in terms of health. Oh, little foot. <laughs> I'm giving mom plenty of space. She is, I noticed the last time I was here as well, she's a little bit more skittish um, than the Inkahumas have been in the past. And her cubs are a little bit nervous as well. So we're giving them plenty of space. Look how fluffy it is. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's a really ridiculously girly thing to say, but they really are so fluffy. One cub on top of the other. And Apparently, the reports are that it's one male and one female. Well, obviously, we haven't had a good enough chance to check that or double-check that for ourselves. But hopefully, once little one here is done... Hello. Oh. Is your sibling making life very difficult? <laughs> hopefully, once little one decides to move, or if little one decides to move, we will be able to have a chance to see their faces and maybe even have a chance to see whether or not we're looking at males or females and they're only for those of you that are new to these safaris they are only a few weeks old um, if we if our timeline is accurate probably only in the region of about six or so weeks old I'm hoping because unfortunately this is Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, just a message for final control. Um, Rebecca, I have your comms perfectly, so I can hear you talking to me. All is well on this magical morning on Cheetah Plains. And apparently you're all excited to see the Styx Cubs. Me too. <laughs> I want to spend the rest of... I want to spend the rest of the Sunday here. Sit and watch the cubs suckle. Enjoy the sun. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It'd be a perfect place to spend the day. And just watch the two of them as they start to wake up. I'm hoping they will, because it's still nice and cool. And there is nothing as playful as a lion cub. That you saw yesterday with Byron on the sunset safari with the Inkahuma cubs. And when they're little, they're even cuter, because they haven't quite mastered the whole coordination thing. Oh, it's fantastic to see these little bundles of joy, mostly because, well, not mostly, it will always be fantastic to see little lion cubs. But just to fill in our new viewers, the sticks cubs, the sticks actually had eight cubs between three of the females. And unfortunately, due to the drought, they were struck down by a very severe case of mange. Now, the females are looking much, much better. At one point, the females were also looking as though they were struggling with it. But the cubs just didn't have the size and the resilience in order to cope with the amount of blood loss that they were going through. So essentially, the, the look at her amber eyes. She's also got amber eyes. Um, so essentially the mite was causing massive, massive anemia in the little Styx cubs and one by one they succumbed to it. The one was killed by elephants and it might be that wasn't mange that killed all of the Styx cubs. Oh, hello. <laughs> Look at that little innocent face. The good news is that these cubs have been born at a much better time a much more hopeful time with all of the rain that is around. They might contract mange, but, and there are some that have, there have been some reports that they do have it. Um, I'm going to wait to see for myself because I'm, our Nkuhumas managed to kick it off and brush it off. And I think that these sticks cubs, now that they're born during the height of the rainy season, I hope they're going to be, I think they're going to be absolutely fine. Little spotted leg, it's dreaming. <laughs> it's little foot moving around. <laughs> And of course, lion cubs born with spots to help to camouflage them. 
And their spots only really disappear once they reach adulthood, and in fact, in some cases, never disappear at all. Um, in some lionesses, you will still see the faint vestiges of the spots around the bellies. Good morning to Jared. You have a question about the size of the sticks versus the Inkuhumas, and you want to know if they, if the sticks are bigger than the Inkuhumas. You know, we've had much debate about this, we, and we seem to have reached uh, different conclusions. My opinion is that the sticks are perhaps maybe slightly stockier, but the Inkuhumas are taller. Uh, that's just from what I've seen, um, from what little I've seen. I haven't spent as much time with the sticks females, and particularly not with the sticks females moving around. Oh, big shake. So I'm not, I, I don't think there's much of a size difference, and there seldom is in an area like this in terms of the genetics that are available. Uh, the Inkuhumas are stronger than the sticks just in sheer in terms of numbers, which means that they did once actually, not so long ago, before the cubs were born, they did actually have an encounter with the sticks reportedly and chased them away which does occasionally, it's quite rare, but it does occasionally happen that lion prides do have a bit of a skirmish. Uh, the one thing about the sticks is that they are not as healthy as the Inkuhumas have been. Um, one of, a couple of the lionesses bear evidence of an sort of underlying condition of tuberculosis, which is very common. The Inkuhumas might be carrying it as well. It's just that the sticks have the swellings around their joints, around their elbows. And every now and again, we see a, a drop or two of blood coming from their noses. Now, that's not a reason for panic. Almost all of the animals out here are or can be carriers of a TB. And in terms of statistics, if you go further south, about 80% of the lions in that area actually carry t tuberculosis. And most of them have a natural immunity to it, so it doesn't really negatively affect them. It only comes into play when they are when their immune systems are weakened in some way whether it be through a bad diet or through mange could also do it mange could also affect them so i'm not sure the jury is out vm is convinced that the sticks are giant lionesses and that they are much much bigger than the inkuhumas and are this roughly the size of birmingham boys <laughs> i i'm not so sure i think the inkuhumas are slightly taller but the sticks might be stockier. But they're very seldom as much in it. These little guys, of course, still have a long way to go. Aww. Seems so long ago that our Inkuhuma's cubs, Inkuhuma cubs were that age, but it wasn't. It was just a couple of months ago. So much has changed. All curled up. Now, if I remember correctly, the very first time I saw the Sticks Cubs properly was Taylor's job interview. Her interview drive, or yes, it was. It was her interview drive. I was driving that morning and she was on the back of the vehicle with me. And now look at them. Hello, little ones. A fly's bugging you, little one. Twitchy ear. Piled on top of each other. Well, there's a good chance that over the next few months we can expect more sticks babies from the other two lionesses. These two have had a little bit of a head start. They are gorgeous. There were reports of There were reports of a, because the sticks were on, or nearly on, Juma yesterday, and there were reports of a new lion, well, I say new lion pride, it's not a new lion pride, it is, as, up until I last read the reports, it was an unidentified lion pride moving through Mala Mala. Uh, that, there's a chance that that might actually have st pushed the other two sticks females more towards Juma. But this female, of course, with these tiny cubs, she's not going to move too far away. She's, they, they, they're capable of walking, and they are if she has to move them. They are capable of moving quite long distances. But for now, she's going to try and keep them safe and tucked away in 
the drainage line that is known as the Juma Dam, confusingly enough, Juma Dam drainage line on Cheetah Plains. And that's because once upon a time Cheetah Plains was Juma, it was the original Juma, essentially owned by the same people who now own Juma. So it remains to be seen. Lions, lion prides, people tend to think of territories, as, especially with lion prides, as sort of like a jigsaw puzzle with perfectly defined boundaries, and it's not the case at all. And it doesn't mean there's any reason to panic. It just means that perhaps a lion pride is pushing out of its normal home range, doing a little bit of a, a sort of a saunter into another territory, and then we'll move back again once they've thoroughly investigated the area. The sticks, because there's only three of them, it makes them slightly more vulnerable. But encounters between lion prides are very, very rare. Lions are very good at avoiding each other when they need to be. You saw this morning with the Nkuhuma and the Birmingham boy, that roaring sound. And that, of course, is a great way of getting to know where everybody is. Or, alternately, warning everyone that you're in the area and to please stay away. Oh, I don't think there's much we can do in improving our view. We've actually got quite a nice view. I was thinking about moving around to the front of her head, but then if her lion cubs do lift their heads up, then we're not going to see them. We'll be blocked by Mom. So we'll just have to wait patiently for these two little bundles of joy to decide to move. Any little ones? Oh, no. I've just looked at the time and I've realized how late it really is. <laughs> We've only got eight more minutes to spend with these little ones. I am going to patiently wait until these lion cubs, or to see if these lion cubs move before the end of the sunrise safari, but Brent does just want to say a quick farewell to you all. Well, I'll make it quick, not keep you away from the cuteness that is the Styx Cubs. Uh, well, we more lost Kula. She went into a thicket we couldn't follow. I'm pretty confident she's going to head down towards the Mawati. So hopefully we'll find her on the sunset safari. So from Jandra and myself, adieu. <laughs> So I hope you've uh, enjoyed the bushwalk with us as much as we've enjoyed it. Some interesting little things, especially the snake skin, that does a really, really great find. Um, starting to warm up a little bit, not too bad. But um, thank you everyone. We'll see you this afternoon again on another bushwalk, uh, same time. So from myself and VM on camera and Herbert, have a wonderful day or evening, wherever you are in the world. We'll see you all later. Goodbye. Let's head back to Jamie. And a wonderful day it has most definitely been. What a lovely way to finish off our sunrise safari then with a perfect a domestic peaceful scene on a Sunday morning. What a perfect way to spend, it is Sunday right, it is Sunday. What a perfect way to spend a Sunday morning than in the presence of two tiny little lion cubs. I constantly need to sort of almost pinch myself to remind myself just how lucky we are to be experiencing moments like this. And for now, they haven't stirred, and that's okay. They've got lots of sleeping to do because they've got lots of growing to do. And just like little babies, oh, hold on, there's a paw there. Let's go and have a look back at the lions. And we're going to stick with them right up until the end of the sunrise safari. And then Geert and myself will begin our long journey back to Juma. It was definitely worth it though, wasn't it? And there's a very good chance that they will be here in the afternoon for the sunset safari. That would be marvellous. In fact, there's all sorts of exciting things planned for the Sunset Safari. <laughs> there's a spotted cuckoo calling. The birds are chirping away merrily. What a perfect Sunday. I can't get over how fluffy they are. You'd think I'd never seen a lion cub before. But still, these are special. Our sticks and our Inkuhuma cubs. <laughs> Snoozing away quite happily. Now, at some point, Mom is going to have to decide what she does now. She's been here for the last 
few days, apparently. Although she moved off, went and joined the rest of her sisters and then came back. But at some point she's going to have to go and find herself a meal. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> scratch behind the ears don't scratch little one you make us all nervous but as I said the ch the, they've got a much better chance if they do contract mange or if they do have mange they've got a much better chance of getting rid of it and not every scratch means mange either but yes the female's going to have to make a choice at some point whether she's going to go and search for food or search for her sisters who hopefully have some food for her and she can't keep providing milk unless she eats. These cubs have apparently been introduced to the rest of the pride, so and perhaps she will take them with her. Perhaps her sisters will come back onto Cheetah Plains and catch something, and we get to watch the little lion cubs as they have their first taste of meat. And they will start eating solid meat in the next few weeks, by three months they will be feeding off it with great relish. And already they're equipped with the little milk teeth that are, if not, you know, they're not bone crushing like the teeth of the adults, but they're strong enough now and sharp enough to be able to nibble off bits of kill. Cute little creatures. This is the joy, of course, of our live safaris, is that when we see them like this, it's so hard to imagine, imagine them as the ferocious hunters that they're going to become. We get to watch that development, or well, most of the time we get to watch that development. Sometimes it takes a very sad turn, but we do get to follow their stories. And just think how, ma how magical it will be in months' time when we're looking back on these screenshots and these moments that you're all recording for history and marvel at the fact that once upon a time these Styx cubs were this small. We're going to do exactly the same thing with the Inkohuma lion cubs. It would be hard to imagine that they were ever once this size. Well, unfortunately, the Sunrise Safari, I got it right that time, the Sunrise Safari is slowly but surely winding down, and it is a time for us to say our goodbyes and our thank yous, so I'm not going to take you away from the Styx Cubs for too long. I am just going to do a very quick farewell from all of us. So a big thank you to Gert for his wonderful camera work, as always. Thank you, Gert. It's been a good day. Yeah. It's been a lovely day. It's been a lion-filled Sunday morning. And a thank you to Rebecca and to Jerry in Final Control for keeping us under control and to the entire Safari Live team, Brent and Jandre, Viam and Byron and of course our tech team in the form of Alex at the moment. But most importantly a big thank you to all of you for joining us. We're going to finish off with just a view of the little lion cubs as the show slowly but surely comes to its conclusion. I hope you have all enjoyed the morning. We've had a fantastic time from the lions roaring Karula, the Queen of Juma, and finishing off with the little Styx cubs. And just to throw it out there, it sounds as though Tingana this morning was on his way towards Arethusa. So who knows what the sunset safari holds. I'll see you there.